Hey, everybody, <clears throat> let's get going. Um, uh, my name is Ed Friedman, uh, Chair of Friends of Miramini Bay. Thank you for joining us tonight on this um, uh, fifth of our fifth, fifth presentation of our 26th season of doing winter speaker series. So I really appreciate everyone joining us tonight. And also, of course, um, appreciate our speaker uh, making the time for us this evening and Martin McDonough, who's our Zoom coordinator who is on board tonight. Uh, we are recording, so if you don't want to be recorded, now is the time to uh, make yourself anonymous or sign off, sign out. A um, couple of things before I go through these slides, I assume everyone's seeing this big picture on the screen here, sort of a title slide. Um, um, if you've got questions during the presentation, please use the chat box thing, which is, I don't know how you get to it, somewhere down at the bottom there, move your cursor around or wherever on your screen, and hopefully the Zoom toolbar comes up and you can click on chat, put a question in there, and we'll have a few minutes at the end for um, for John to address um, some or all of those. Um, I will uh, mention, I think everyone's audio is off, everyone's muted except for myself and Martin and John. Um, uh, if you do end up unmuting at some point, please make sure your phones are off, things like that, so it doesn't start ringing. And I'll also mention that I just picked up today from the printer our winter 2023 newsletter, first newsletter of the year. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, focus in there on a, a sort of prehistoric and wooden weir, uh, fishing weir. Um, complex that we found a couple of years ago out here in the bay. And then there's also a great uh, sort of op-ed piece on PFAS chemicals and what's going into the Androscoggin River from the former Brunswick Naval Air Station. Um, so with that, I'm gonna run through these a few slides, intro slides. I know some of you have been here before, done this. Uh, just give folks a sense of what we do. And then I'll introduce um, our speaker tonight. So thank you. All right, whoops, got from one waiting to come in. <laughs> There we go. All right. So, as many of you know, we are we we do take a holistic look at uh, the environment, and we we do a lot of research. Use our research, some of it cutting edge, to to uh, inform our advocacy. Also, which is also <clears throat> somewhat cutting edge, oftentimes. Um, we are a land trust, protected well over a thousand acres, fifteen hundred acres of land. Uh, around the bay, our focus is on valuable wildlife habitat as opposed to recreation stuff. And we have an active education component somewhat hit by COVID lately, but still still going pretty strong. This is part of it. So a few slides here of some of the different things that we've done over the years. Uh, Multi-year circulation study of the bay, invasive species, using caged bivalves to look at um, whether the mills were still discharging dioxin or not once they changed their methodology, their, their procedures. Um, Done a lot of archaeology over the years, often on land we protected using land for many future funds. Um, again, a lot of the advocacy has revolved around fish passage. And I'll mention right now that speaking of that, and obviously the topic this evening, um, that uh, the Kennebec uh, Valley chapter of Child Unlimited is circulating a petition to um, uh, get people to sign on to the removal of the four lower dams on the Kennebec River, which would be great. And I'd say, don't stop at the Kennebec. Let's get the Androscoggin too. But that is out there. Um, we may try and get that up on our website. But I, I think that the easiest thing to do is probably use your your uh, internet search engine and type in something like Kennebec Valley Trout Unlimited um, Kennebec Dam Petition, and I'm sure you will get to it. It's a good article about it, and and it's a, a good petition, and that's all in process. Uh, I mentioned education. <clears throat> we we haven't been doing our Bay Days, outside Bay Days, because of COVID. We want us to keep everyone safe. But we are working individually with some schools and stuff. And in the process of kind of um, finishing up a, a sort of a living history theater film project with the Bowdoin Elementary School, which will be really cool. And hopefully, hopefully we can repeat that with other schools. So it's completed a 36 acre conservation easement towards the latter part of this last year. Uh, we've got a couple of easements in the works now. And if you know of people that missed tonight's program and want to 
catch it. Again, it is recorded. And if you go to the home page and scroll down the right side to education, you'll see a speaker series video list here. And within a few days or so, we should have that um, posted. Here's the rest of the series, or the whole series, but the rest of it for the season. I will highlight um, our March presentation. These are these are all, with the exception of tonight, on the second Wednesday of the month. So this is a real uh, unusual one in that regard. But um, next month, uh, Al Manville, who actually lives in Brunswick now, it's where splits his time between Brunswick and Moosehead, it's a career U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service senior biologist, and he was the um, the Fish and Wildlife Service lead for um, impacts of um, telecommunication and other towers, um, the structure itself, the guy lines, the radio frequency radiation from it, the lights, all that stuff on birds and bats. So that should be real interesting. And now I'll just introduce John and then I'll, I'll hand my screen over to him. Um, John Waldman, he joined the faculty of Queens College, City University of New York. He's a tenured professor of biology in 2004. Uh, for the 20 years before that, John was employed by the Hudson River Foundation for Science and Environmental Research, mostly as a senior scientist for them. Uh, he received his PhD in 1986 from the Joint Program in Evolutionary Biology between the American Museum of Natural History and the City University of New York, and prior to that, an MS in Marine and Environmental <coughs> Science from Long Island University. As an aquatic conservation biologist, John has authored more than 90 scientific articles, several popular books, and a number of scientific volumes. He's also been an occasional contributor to the New York Times and other periodicals. And with that, I will uh, again thank John and welcome you, John. And I will stop sharing so you can uh, flip over to you. Hopefully. How is that? I see your, the, the, there we go, there's the big screen. Sounds good. Excellent. Well, thank you, Ed, for that introduction and also to the friends for inviting me to speak about a uh, subject that I'm passionate about. Uh, I have a deep affection for Maine, even though I'm based in New York, I usually spend a week in June chasing landlocked salmon and brook trout and some of the great rivers of Maine. And I have a lot of friends up there that I'm trying to help with their um, dam removal and fish passage issues. So tonight I'm gonna to give you a broad overview of uh, my thoughts about this issue, but then ratchet down into some specific information about Maine. <clears throat> so uh, we focus on roughly a dozen species of fish. These are the diagemous fish that move between fresh and salt water as a basic part of the life cycle. And uh, the species I'm gonna focus on um, tonight are American shad and river herring and Atlantic salmon, but there's a number of others. And it's uh, interesting that they are a very small segment of the world's fish species. There are about 20,000 plus species of fish on the planet, and only about um, 200 are diadromous. Um, and Maine actually has a high number of them, uh, roughly a dozen, which is more than most places, um, most coastlines along uh, various continents. Uh, they range from the ultra primitive sea lamprey uh, to the most uh, phylogenetically or evolutionarily uh, recent striped bass. And, and you can see that there's great differences in the overall morphology and, and types. Um, this kind of life history pattern has emerged again and again. It isn't like there was just one branch that became diagemous. Um, it's, it's a life history strategy that has its pros and cons. And, uh, it's emerged a number of times. So these fish have been <clears throat> important um, in, the, in the social context. This is a, a lithograph from the Hudson River from Bernard Lossing from 1886. And it shows a fishing station in the background where you can see some large nets being dried. In those days, nets were made from cotton and they rotted if they uh, weren't dried. So you had to take care of them, unlike with nylon nets today. And it's no coincidence <clears throat> that the three species of fish that are pictured here are all anadromous fish that are spawned in fresh water and go to the sea. These are the species that could reliably every year be counted upon to uh, put on flesh in the open ocean and then return to rivers and deliver it 
on schedule uh, for those who are prepared to catch them. And uh, that's why we see a sturgeon, the shad, and the striped bass instead of a you know, yellow perch and a catfish and a sucker. These, these fish basically imported the riches of the sea back to rivers. And this was really shown quite <clears throat> concretely for me, <coughs> excuse me, with a postcard that I found in an antique shop in Cape Cod many years ago. And it shows, uh, has a caption, Cape Cod herring fishing, North Harwich, Massachusetts. And uh, it's one of these little creeks you see in Cape Cod that support runs of, of alewives. And uh, the thing about Cape Cod is given its history, it seems like every creek is named either the Mill River or the, uh, the Herring River, depending on uh, which usage was, was um, used first. But the thing about this, this image is that for me, it, it caught the, or captured the perils and promise of, of these kinds of um, fish runs. This little creek has been manicured for fish catching. You can see the fish will come up here from the sea, enter this pond looking to get to the spawning pond up here, but only getting there if they allow it to pass uh, from, with this dam, which can be opened up to allow fish to pass. And it's been, you know, just manicured for fish production. This, this pool is a seining pool and they would drop a net in there, pull the catch back to shore, put the fish in barrels and send them off to the market. And uh, it was wonderfully productive. I found out that it produced about 400 barrels of river herring a year, and that's a lot of fish. And the thing about this that, that just strikes me as uh, the promise and, and the wonder of these fish is that if you went looking for these same individual fish during, um, let's say, July or October in the open ocean, you could have 100 boats with nets and, and not find a single one. But you know that based on past experience, somewhere around March 15th or March 25th or whatever, these fish will come marching up the river and will basically throw themselves upon your mercy. And if you're smart and you allow enough of them to get through to the spawning area, maybe you can shut the fishery for a few days per week, you will have a sustainable production of, of fish forever. And if you're foolish and you overfish, you don't allow them to get into the pond, you crash the fishery. And this is a, a microcosm of what we have along the entire Atlantic coast uh, on a bigger scale with our bigger rivers. Uh, we, we have not let the fish get up here to spawn. So in, in working on my book, Running Silver, and Running Silver <clears throat> is a term that was used in the old days when a river was so full of fish that the water looked silver from their bodies, they would say, hey, the river's running silver, let's go get them. And uh, I like to collect quotes from those times because uh, these were people from Europe who were colonists who were looking at runs of fish that they had never seen in, in Europe because Europe had been overfished and over timbered and over everything for, for centuries before this. So they were pretty much blown away. So for instance, William Wood wrote that the alewives came to spawn in such multitudes as it is almost incredible. Uh, Whitbourne said such abundance as is incredible. And my favorite but was by William Byrd from the Natural History of Virginia. In a word, it is unbelievable, indeed, undescribable, as also incomprehensible what quantity is found there. One must behold oneself. And we have not seen abundances like this. I would say that around the entire US, there is not a single river that has um, anadromous fish runs as large as when the colonists first came here. And in some cases, the declines have been orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude um, from what they were in the beginning. And I consider this to be one of America's greatest conservation failures. So looking at river herring today, river herring is the catch-all term for alewives and blueback herring. Uh, they were likened to passenger pigeons at one point because they were so numerous, but we know what happened to passenger pigeons. And um, looking just at recent um, decades from 1950 in, in the dark blue to nearly the present, you see that the catches of these fish um, in the Northeast have come down to almost nothing. Places that had wide open herring fisheries are now closed. Massachusetts total closure, Rhode Island total closure, Connecticut near total, New York closed everywhere, but in the Hudson where it's reduced. And uh, you know this, this is what has happened to these fish in general. In, uh, in researching the book, <clears throat> I stumbled upon um, Henry David Thoreau's work, uh, A Week on the Concord of Merrimack Rivers, and he's much more 
well known for his work on a certain pond, but this is a great book. And uh, it was conducted, the, the, the trip was conducted for about 10 days actually with his brother. He made the trip in 1839. He, he self-published the book in 1849. And as he was paddling these rivers uh, and people were, were swarming to the, uh, the mills that were giving them what they thought would be a great economic future, he saw the river being ruined and basically said these, these fish were essentially screwed. There was no hope for them with what was being done to these rivers. And um, I collected a, a number of, of great quotes from that, that book, but the one that really just sort of tugs at your heart is he asked the question, who hears the fishes when they cry? <laughs> and he was hearing them cry as he saw this river just uh, commandeered for, for industry. So this is what the, uh, the Merrimack eventually became in downtown Manchester. Some of these mills were the size of football fields. They, they supported uh, or they offered jobs to hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people. And the river was just turned into a sluiceway uh, for pollution and power. Um, and the fish runs pretty much disappeared, but there was an attempt to restore the runs to some degree with a fish ladder. And I'll talk more about fish ladders later, but this is the fish ladder that goes from the, uh, the main river up to the first reservoir. And you can go to the Amiskeag Fishway Center. Uh, they have a learning and visitor center and they, they ask you to celebrate the magic of the Merrimack. But when I was there, there was no magic. This is the fish viewing screen where you could watch the fish that come up the, uh, the ladder swim past you. And most years there are anywhere from zero to, to very low numbers. The only fish that was living that I saw was um, a goldfish in a tank. And the only other shad I saw was this fiberglass one. So um, I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't feel the magic of the Merrimack. And, and this is, as you'll see, a very common situation with um, our fish passage. It, it's really um, maintaining, in most cases, very small relic runs. So what's changed over time since the colonists first came here? One factor is size. And in general, fish are getting smaller for a number of reasons. Um, this is a, a wonderful image that you should see. If you're ever on the east side of the Hudson River at uh, Hyde Park, there's a post office there that has murals of the Hudson from the 1940s. And this shows a giant Atlantic sturgeon being landed uh, across from this, this dock. And uh, sturgeon reached 14 feet in those days in the Hudson and elsewhere. And I thought they were probably gone forever, but several years ago, some remote sensing uh, was done in the Hudson that detected a school of sturgeon on the bottom uh, very accurately and found one that was 14 feet long. So it's nice to know that uh, even in, in the early 2000s now, we have some of these monsters swimming past Manhattan every spring to spawn on the Hudson. Um, the best information I could find on um, changes in size actually came from John McPhee's book, The Founding Fish, about the importance of shad to the uh, European colonization of this country. And uh, he found evidence or information that in the Delaware River, shad packed 40 to the barrel in the year 1800 and 100 to the same size barrel in, in 1900. And these are individual shad that are bigger than we see I mean, each of them is bigger than the biggest one we see typically in most rivers in recent years. So I worked on a paper with a colleague of mine, Karin Lindbergh from uh, SUNY ESF in New York. And we looked at the status of these fish and published it in bioscience in 2009. And we looked at 22 species that are found in Europe, North America, or both. And we found that about half of them don't have um, enough data to really say much about because they don't have high commercial value. And for that reason, they were not um, funded for study, but we found all the others lost populations. For instance, American shad lost half of their populations and about a third of Atlantic salmon populations in North America have been extirpated. But this was the, uh, the real take home um, message. This was from the paper. And uh, what you have on the left side, the left panel, are data from the American shore and on the other side, data from the European shore. And what you see in case after case after case, and by the way, these are all standardized to uh, zero to one. So they're easily comparable. 
what you see in case after case is crash, 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 crash. Um, this was the pattern for these fish and very few of them have the little upturn you see here for striped bass. Striped bass were, the, the Chesapeake Bay stock crashed in the late 70s and early 80s from overfishing. <clears throat> but it was a case where the driver was a single driver. Overfishing was the main reason. And once the overfishing was uh, tamped down, those fish returned. In many of these other cases, you have multiple drivers and we have not figured out how to reverse these declines. And if you put this in perspective here, we found that across these populations, we had a 98% decline from historic highs in 13 of them and 90% in an additional 11. So uh, we have really, really uh, done a number on these fish. Looking at uh, some case histories for Atlantic salmon, um, the Atlantic Salmon Federation estimates that there were 300 to 500,000 salmon running into US rivers annually when the colonists first came here. And um, in 2014, we know that there were fewer than 400 that ran up American rivers. And in 2022, there's been a bit of recovery up to about 1,500. So we're still orders of magnitude below uh, the original numbers. And um, it's now come down to Maine. Salmon used to run all the way west to the Usatonic River, um, but they have not been there for centuries probably. And the Connecticut River restoration didn't work. So uh, Maine is the last hope for Atlantic salmon in uh, the US. Um, shad have declined dramatically. And part of this is because they cannot get to their spawning grounds. This is an old map from the 1800s of how far shad penetrated in each of the rivers that they spawned in. And my colleague calculated that uh, there's been a net loss of about 40% of their spawning range. And they were a big part of uh, society in the uh, river valleys where they occurred. This is uh, right at the outflow of Lake Otsego in central New York. Shad used to reach this point, which is about 450 miles from the uh, Chesapeake Bay, uh, deep into the interior of New York. And some of the catches made in that river were just extraordinary. Here's a, a landing of shad and, and, and river herring be made. Um, they were a big part of social life. They would celebrate spring. Shad came in the spring and they were a, uh, you know, a direct, nutritious, tasty symbol of spring. So many, many towns would have shad bakes, community-wide shad bakes, where they would fillet the fish and plank them on oak planks with bacon and, uh, and have a festival. Um, these, these runs of fish were just so different from what we have today. Uh, Right down here around Scranton, there was a fishery uh, that um, actually utilized spotters on the hills to look for schools of shad moving up the river. And they could actually see the water bulge from the bodies of these fish. And there was another fishery right at the mouth of the uh, river at Harbor de Grace that famously put out a giant seine uh, one day when a northwest wind started to blow very strongly and they couldn't haul the net back against the wind uh, and the tide. And it sat out there for three days. And then it took, I think, a couple of days to actually land it. And they estimated they caught 15 million shad and river herring in that one haul. So one of the issues with uh, getting people to take this more seriously is to understand the history of these fish. and. There's a generic kind of um, phenomenon that's been noted by this very well-known fish biologist, Daniel Pauly, called the shifting baseline syndrome that I think should be much more widely known than it is. And he wrote a, a very influential paper where the key paragraph <clears throat> read that each generation of fishery scientists accepts as a baseline the stock size that occurred at the beginning of their careers and uses this to evaluate changes. When the next generation starts its career, the stocks have further declined, but it is the stocks at that time that serve as a new baseline. And the importance of this can be shown by uh, this um, graph showing shad catches in the Potomac River. This is, uh, these are the shad landings uh, in millions of kilograms from 1887 to a little past the year 2000. And 
you know, it is nothing to be proud of. These, these fish, you know, basically crashed from what seems like a robust number here on the left side of the plot. But now remember what 1887 is showing here and look at it going deeper in time. Here's 1887 here in comparison with 1814, 1824, and another year around 1830. Um, if you only looked this far backwards, you would have a whole different picture about the potential of this river to produce shad than you would from going back further in time. So we, we need to focus a little more, not on how much our, you know, how, how our fish passage numbers change from you know, 20 fish one year to 30 to another. Um, we have to look at what do these numbers relate to in terms of deep history? And uh, it's, it's not a good comparison. So what can be done about this? Well, I divided um, the various forces that affect these fish into what I call drivers. And some of these drivers are essentially untractable. One of them is non-native species. I think non-native species actually are underappreciated as a driver. Um, you know, for instance, largemouth bass and smallmouth bass were not native to Maine or even to the Hudson, um, and yet they are major predators on juvenile shad and herring coming out of the river. Uh, once non-native species are in place, you can't get rid of them. Another example are zebra mussels in the Hudson River that have done a lot of damage to the ecology of the river. So the best strategy here is prevention, but um, now we have to deal with the fact that these creatures are uh, probably driving down uh, numbers of these migratory fish. Climate is also essentially untractable. Yes, in theory, we can reverse it, but I don't think that's happening anytime soon. And I think there's huge momentum built into continued warming. So uh, climate is absolutely having an effect both on the distribution of these fish and also on the timing of their runs in rivers. Uh, it's been shown that they are coming into some rivers earlier than they used to, which may have some negative effects on the uh, survival of the young. Then we have drivers that are largely rectified. I'm not saying that every river on the East Coast is uh, unpolluted or virginal in its water quality, but pollution was never that huge a problem for the fish anyway. The Hudson River, for instance, had much bigger runs of shed back in the days before the Clean Water Act than it does today. Um, Pollution is not to be glorified or, or desired, but it was never that big a problem except in a few extreme cases. Then we have drivers that are tractable and mostly applied. One of these is overfishing. Overfishing is maybe the most easily solved problem in theory, but you also have fishermen, commercial fishermen in particular, who do not want to give up their livings and it becomes uh, politically touchy. But we have done a decent job on reducing overfishing. And then some rivers, rivers have large numbers of power plants like the Hudson and Chesapeake Bay that bring in a lot of um, eggs and larvae into the bowels of their plants and basically cook them as, as the water is used to cool the power plants. <laughs> but these are being phased out with closed cycle cooling, which should uh, remediate that. So what is tractable but still unrectified is really only one driver, and you might guess what it is, it's dams. Uh, here's the famous Conowingo Dam. This is the dam that blocks the next 500 miles of the Susquehanna River. It's only a few miles up from the, the mouth of the river. Um, it has done tremendous damage to the ecology of this, this river. And um, the, Sus the Conowingo and some other dams right above it um, did not at first have fish passage, but now they have fish ladders or fish elevators. If you're not familiar with fish ladders, Fish ladder basically is a device where water flows from the top of the dam down some kind of a, um, a linear tube that has these baffles that slow the water down and allow fish to pass from chamber to chamber. And they are not universally loved by fish. There are certain species that would never use them, like you won't find a striped bass or a sturgeon in a fish ladder. Um, salmon will use them pretty freely. Um, they don't work terribly well on shad on the East Coast. And uh, still, it's it's what, it, it looks like it's a fix. You know, the average public uh, viewer looks at this and thinks, well, there's a dam there, it's blocking the river, but it's got a fish ladder, so there's no problem. Well, there is a problem. Fish ladders don't work very well. <laughs> then we have fish elevators. There are some dams that are so tall that you can't ask a fish to climb <clears throat> a ladder of that height. So elevators attract the fish to a, uh, area where they 
are put in, they're basically drawn into a basket that then goes up this device and they're released to the reservoir level above the dam. And they are more uh, generalized in the fish they move, but they have lots of issues. I have a student who's just been cataloging how often they break down and aren't being used and it, it, it's actually a, a big problem. And um, they may be better than ladders in some cases, but they're, they're not uh, the ultimate solution. Then there's one that's almost comical, um, moving fish by truck. This, this, this truck is labeled Operation Fish Run, Fish for the Future. And in this case, what happens is uh, you net the fish below the first dam, and then you drive them quickly up to wherever they need to spawn. And they, uh, they get about an hour's ride and they are let go. And as pathetic as it is to have a fish run, you know, driven by the internal combustion engine, um, it does get the pain over with quickly and may actually in some cases produce better results than letting the fish figure out the fish ladders and the fish elevators on their own. <clears throat> so there's been, uh, you know, a great deal of um, effort um, exerted to figure out, you know, what to do about this. Um, and uh, there are target numbers for restorations on some big northeastern rivers. The rivers that I looked at with some colleagues were the Merrimack, the Connecticut, and the Susquehanna. And the targets are not ambitious compared to uh, what was there originally. Nonetheless, you can see that in the case of Susquehanna, essentially flatline near zero, um, Connecticut got up to about 5% once, and the Merrimack had this anomalous rise to 25% at one point, but then it crashed down to, to nothing. So it ain't working. Uh, one of the ways you might look at this are with passage efficiencies for shed. Passage efficiencies look at how many pass the first dam that either go to the second in blue or to the last dam they need to surpass to actually spawn. And uh, the beauty of the, the one corollary to having dams with these engineered fishways that is useful is that you get to count every fish that passes. So you know how many pass the first dam, and then you can see how many from there make it to the last dam. And looking at the red here, the Merrimack is flatlined, Connecticut is close to flatlined, and the Susquehanna is essentially flatlined. So um, these, these multiple dam situations are not working. So there's a great um, Atlantic Coast precedent for doing the right thing, which is dam removal. And that is the uh, removal of the Edwards Dam on the Kennebec, which was built in 80, 1837 and was finally breached in 1999. And for those, I think it's 162 years, it's, it's, it's quite a long time. Uh, for over that entire period, there was no fish way on the dam. And this dam produced only three and a half megawatts of power. As, as John McPhee joked in his book, that's about enough to uh, light up the L.L. Bean warehouse, but not anything else. So um, this was finally breached with the um, okay of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in 1999. It opened up 17 miles of river of main stem that had been completely uh, precluded from um, having these fish um, reach you know, in any given spring. Uh, and it also provided access to the Sebastocook tributary, which is a river that alewives just love. And uh, that run went from zero for 162 years to as almost 6 million within several years. So here's the Sebastocook and the run was so large and the fish so, so easily gained that a lot of uh, lobster fishermen come from the coast to get bait there, which is uh, a very important commodity. Um, it attracted over 50 bald eagles that make a living there in the spring feeding on these fish. And people got so excited about this revitalized run that there's now a uh, alewife festival in the town of Venton nearby. So it just shows, it's another case of dam removal working wonderfully well. I don't know of any dam removals that haven't done the job in revitalizing um, migratory fish populations. There's other reasons to think about this too, and that includes the aging of the dams. You know, New England was the first part of the US settled from Europeans, and our dams are older than around the rest of the country, and uh, they're, they're starting to really look their age. They're not meant to last forever. 
And uh, I went on a tour of some dams with a colleague of mine a few years ago in New England. And I'm not an engineer, but some of them were scary. I mean, I, 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 I see decrepitude when it's in front of me and um, it ain't good. So, uh, and we have a little bit of history now with dams failing on the East Coast. In South Carolina in 2015, there was this incredible, uh, roughly a foot of rainfall in a very short amount of time. And 49 dams failed and 18 people died. And with what's happening with our weather systems now, where we're getting greater and greater uh, downpours uh, more frequently because of climate, we're gonna see more of these dams failing. So we should be thinking not only about the biology of the rivers, and even though I'm focused on the migratory fish, you have to understand that uh, each segment between dams creates an island, and that is that precludes movement among sections and harms the uh, the resident species in the river too, and some non-fish. Another aspect to this that is um, worth noting is that hydropower is neither clean because, you know, as Ed showed in his, one of his slides, he saw an eel that had been cut up by a turbine. So it's causing ecological damage directly in that respect. But also a lot of times these dams are, the turbines are shut down because the water is too high, the water is too low, or they need to, uh, to clean them or refurbish them. So even though a, a dam like the Conolingo is rated at 548 megawatts capacity, and you know if you look at Wikipedia, you're gonna think, okay, that's what it produces every day of the year. The reality is most of the time it's well below 250. So it's not even producing what it's cracked up to be producing. So I, I looked at hydropower more closely with some colleagues, and this is the uh, 2016 National Hydropower Map. And you can see that Maine is just filled with uh, small dams. Uh, I think Maine has the third highest number of dams in the country, but many of them are retrofits of small uh, water control dams for logging and so on. Um, then you can see that the TVA dams are large down here. And of course the Columbia system is, is tremendous and other parts of the country have very few dams. So we have great opportunities here on the East Coast to rectify uh, the situation with dams. And I looked at a, um, concept I've been advancing of replacing hydropower with solar power. And hydropower produces less than 7% of all the electricity in this country. And we found that uh, there are 2,603 hydropower dams in the lower 48 states. It would take about a million point three acres of land to replace all that hydropower with uh, solar. And that's about equal in size to Delaware, which is a very small state. So just picture Delaware now being cut up and distributed around the country. And it's about 0.06% of the lower 48 states land area. And the 2,603 is the total number of hydropower dams. But realize that many of those will not be coming down for ecological reasons. Um, some of them are on falls, for instance, where even if you took the dam down, there's no way the fish could pass. So, um, our target here would be a lot less than 2,603. And the concept that I was uh, playing with that I would love to see actually applied somewhere, and it would be great if it was in Maine, is what I called the shared river concept. And this is the idea that if you have a reservoir here with the outline here in brown, if you were to breach the dam, the fish would come rushing in and you would be left with um, dry land on the bottom here that is for the first time usable again now that the water is gone. And you could put solar arrays out on that, that dry land. You also could use floating solar, which works very well in, in, in East Asia, um, anywhere you have ponded water. You might even capture some power from the river using hydrokinetic turbines without blocking the river. And because reservoirs occur in valleys, you might have a good opportunity for wind turbines out around the edges. So in the end, you could have an energy park that produces more power and more forms of power to make it more resilient. And you could capitalize on the fact that transmission lines are very expensive, but transmission lines were already here to move the hydropower away. So this is a concept that needs to be tried. Let me just focus now on the state of Maine. This is something that may not happen for a very long time. This is one morning's catch of salmon on the Bangor Salmon Pool in the Penobscot River in 1926. Uh, this might be the total size of a run today 
in a major main river, but this is one morning's catch. Uh, the recent 10 year average in the Kennebec is about 30 fish annually. So looking at the entire state of Maine, we found there were 241 hydro dams with a 726 megawatt nameplate capacity, which means that the mean is only three megawatts per dam. So a lot of your dams are producing very little power and it would not be a big loss to, to take them down. Uh, about three quarters of your power comes from only 24 dams. And to replace all the dams in Maine, we estimated you would need a little under 20,000 acres or uh, about 0.08% of the state area, which is equal to the footprint of the uh, city of Augusta. And here is your, your cloud of, of, of dams as of 2002. And we looked more closely at the Kennebec alone. If you haven't read Kennebec, uh, you know, Cradle of American Rivers um, by, by Coffin, you certainly should. And I love the term that he used for uh, the fish production there. He called the river a Shangri-La for fishes. Uh, and I think this river has enormous potential if it was unshackled again. So the Kennebec has 14 hydropower dams. They yield 246 megawatts of uh, power. Their capacity factors range between 26 and 73%, which means that they're not reaching full capacity most of the time. And we estimated you need about 3,000 acres for full replacement of all the hydro dams in the Kennebec watershed or about 0.03% of the watershed. But if you're interested in salmon, particularly in the Kennebec, what you really wanna do is get the fish to the Sandy River, which is the best spawning tributary um, in the Kennebec system. And um, that's blocked by four dams. Atkins in 1867 estimated before 1820 that the run size of salmon in the Kennebec was between 68,000 and 216,000. Uh, in contrast, in 2018, there were a total of 11 salmon that were trapped and trucked to the Sandy River. Uh, and again, the recent average is 30 per year. So it, it's, it's dismal what's going on there. And you could have free access to the Sandy River by removing the Lockwood, Hydro-Quebec, Shawmut, and Weston dams. Their, their total rated capacity is 43 megawatts, um, and you would need about 500 acres to replace them with solar. But there's no reason why you would have to use solar alone. You know, right now, um, the whole Atlantic coast is slated for huge amounts of offshore wind, uh, a lot of it being floating offshore wind further offshore. Um, right now, the East Coast has seven wind turbines, five at Block Island and two of Virginia. Um, Europe has 4,000, and there are plans for somewhere between 800 and 1,000 along our shores. With that kind of energy coming on board, we could give up 43 megawatts in a blink of an eye. Uh, so there's, there's great opportunity with this new power coming in to, to actually make some changes that are uh, you know, overdue. So what can be done? You know, ultimately we need to free our rivers in space and time. They, these are engineering diagrams on the right of main rivers with all their dams. And it looks like railroad tracks with, with railroad ties. Uh, the rivers are just completely shackled by dams. In a healthy river, and, and what happens with these situations is that you get a relict run that comes in over a short period of time, and the fish try to ascend the first dam, and then they 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 takes a while to figure out how to get over that first ladder. They enter a reservoir that has no current, so then they have to swim the reservoir and figure out where the current's coming in, and then try to pass the second dam, and then. The same thing happens for the third dam and the fourth dam. By the time they get past the fourth dam, uh, they are tired and have probably arrived weeks late. In a healthy river, you have the fish arriving for a long period of time in the spring. Some of them may spawn early downriver somewhere. Some may be spawning later upriver, but you get some fine tuning of the run to the characteristics of the river. And the fish can leave freely here there's a challenge in getting back to the sea and quite often the adults can't make it. So you only have a one-time spawn out of them when they're little fish. Here, they can come back two or three or four times in a healthy river that's not blocked. So we have to somehow convert what you see on the right to what you see on the left. So there are many issues with the Brookfield proposals that uh, are looking to have FERC relicensing for the dams uh, the, on the lower Kennebec. Uh, Maine DMR has serious concerns with the proposed fishway expectations. 
for upstream passage. Um, they consider that the proposed 95% passage at each dam within 48 hours is unrealistic, and I agree completely. Um, the same is true for critical downstream passage. And, you know, the situation is largely being assessed with modeling. And uh, there's an old saying about modeling, all models are wrong, some models are useful, but you can't fall too, too much in love with your models. So just to take you back to a, a great comparison with the lower Kennebec, as I said, Shad used to run in Chesapeake Bay all the way to uh, Lake Otsego uh, way up here, and they had to surpass these four dams. Uh, prior to the dams being built, I, I believe that the run in the Susquehanna was in the tens of millions. Um, in recent years, and these, these, these counts are made you know, very carefully because you have such control over the fish passing through your fishways, uh, a typical year, uh, well, let me just say first that the goal is three quarters of a million past the fourth dam, which is way lower than was there originally. But still, people would like to see three quarters of a million. It would be a nice, refreshing change. Um, in 2014, just as kind of a random year, 10,000 passed Conowingo, 2,500 passed Holtwood, uh, 1,300 passed Safe Harbor, and eight fish passed York Haven. So we, we went from tens of millions to eight fish, and some years it's zero. So we're looking at you know six orders of magnitude decline. I don't think it's going to be any different in the lower Kennebec. The track record for uh, fish passing multiple dams um, in any Atlantic River is, is abysmal. So I think it's time to dish the status quo. Uh, we've had 50 years of East Coast fishways with constant tweaking. I have friends who are engineers who work on fishways. They believe in them. They, they, they are constantly trying to improve them. But if you haven't succeeded in 50 years, it's not going to happen. So there's no reason to believe they ever will succeed in restoring migration um, with these tools. Uh, fortunately, the Endangered Species Act provides real leverage for real restoration. Um, the National Marine Fisheries Service is about to issue a biop or biological opinion on the uh, proposed uh, actions by Brookfield. And we really need them to take a strong stand, do the right thing and uh, pave the way for removals of these dams. So I'm gonna finish with this slide, which is a famous one that I, I love. It's from the West Coast. It shows chum salmon crossing a flooded road. And it shows, it shows the, the, the initiative, the power of, of this kind of life cycle. These fish will do anything to get to their spawning grounds. Um, I remember being in, in Alaska and seeing pink salmon trying to flop their way up a 45 degree slope that had water trickling through it. Um, so the point is if you, you know, it's kind of like the opposite of the field of dreams. The field of dreams said that if you build it, they will come. In the case of uh, Atlantic Coast rivers, re removing dams will allow them to, uh, to, to arrive and come too. So I'll stop there and uh, take any questions or comments. Thank you, John. That was, that was great. Um, looking in the, um, the chat room, I don't really actually see, not terribly, savvy with this but i'm not seeing much here right now um but yeah if people want to chime in with something please please do um i would note on one of those slides you had a you had a figure from uh, asf atlantic sound federation suggesting that the historical runs were 300 to 500,000 atlantic salmon they gotta be way more than that so they want really, to really think so i i, I find that a very large number um but well, well if the i mean you, you talked about the kennebec being or or, or uh, was it Spence, Spence Baird or whoever was uh, Kennebec having a run of over 200,000 and the Androscoggin was 100,000 and you know then you get Penobscot. Penobscot of course yeah yeah so and then they got the other and, and I think that number was just in general it wasn't just Maine maybe it should have been just Maine but obviously then the Connecticut and you know Merrimack and other rivers that they yeah. used to have so I got that number from John Burroughs of the Atlantic Salmon oh. Federation and he actually felt that it, it's kind of like their official number, but he thinks it's actually low too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. you may be onto something there. Yeah. Well, just, I mean, based on all the estimates, it doesn't, doesn't really seem to add up. So um, I actually had, a, I was out, um, something I'll, I'll tell you about the sturgeon, um, that I, I was out working on our, our current study or something a number of years ago, and we had one eel fisherman left who was using pots for adult eels out here. 
and I ran into him one day and uh, he described to me being up here on the bay under under the power lines at Avogadacid Point and uh, being in an eddy on the side of the river and having a seeing a um, a sturgeon come alongside that was as long as his boat, which <laughs> like like mine was a 20, 21 foot skiff. Um, wow. And we I, I'll, I'll have a picture I'll show, I'll send you later of a, of a nice big fish caught up here. But uh, yeah, there were some monsters out there in the old days. They reached 800 pounds. Yep. And there may still be some like that. Uh, they're very, you know, for a fish that's gigantic, it's very cryptic. It's hard to hard to get your hands on a sturgeon. And, you know, they live in deep water and they only come into rivers as adults to spawn. So um, they're just out there and we don't know a whole lot about, um, you know, the locations or their size and their status. Um, I've been studying sturgeon for a while and I, I, I just think they're you know, the great mystery species. Which, which is great. <laughs> in my in my brain yeah it's nice to have some mysteries you know yeah. in today's today's world yeah eric hutchins wrote in the chat that it's worth mentioning that permitting will begin later in 2023 to remove the talbot mills dam that blocks all fish passage on the concord river that henry david thoreau studied extensively so that's good news you know i i do think that we're seeing a slow ramping up of dam removals um uh, it's still not nearly as common as it needs to be uh, and, you know, I, I'm most familiar with the Hudson watershed and uh, the state never had a tradition of dam removal in, in the Hudson. They're finally getting into it in a, in a bigger way. And one of my former students, um, doctoral student, George Jackman, is now the habitat person for Hudson Riverkeeper. And uh, he estimates there are somewhere between 1,400 and 2,000 dams in the Hudson Valley, many of them serving no, no purpose whatsoever anymore. And he, he's even finding dams out in the woods that no one even knew existed anymore. Uh, oh. So, you know, it, it's it's a big job and um, it's not an easy thing to do. You know, the, the, we're, we're, some people refer to rivers like that as retired rivers. They should sort of be given their their pension and allowed to to live again because they, they did their job, you know, in terms of the Industrial Revolution. But now, you know, th those masses of concrete are just sitting there through inertia and um, it's not easy to take a dam out. And it gets even more complicated when you realize that in many situations, you have to be concerned about the sediment quality behind the dam before it can be removed. Uh, because if it's an industrial river, it may have a lot of contaminants and uh, you may have to then dredge them and send them to some landfill in Pennsylvania or something. So it, it's just not a simple task. Well, we, it, needs, we, it needs to we happen have, more and more. We have, we have a lot of those here in Maine. And, sure. and, and it's interesting that on, um, a lot of those smaller dams and other conflict you can get into is with local historical societies who, who want to preserve them or you know preserve some part of them but uh, it's a problem so, so someone asks what happens if they're not enough dam not enough dam is removed and uh, yeah i mean i think we say goodbye to the fish um but uh, steve has a question steve brook has a question here what's, sure. the, what's the likelihood the uh, national marine fisheries service will issue a jeopardy opinion in their uh, biological opinion. And they asked if you saw the article in last week's New York Times about sturgeon and our federal agency's inability to protect species under the ESA. Yeah, I did see the article and it was um, in the New York Times Magazine. It was an excellent article <clears throat> about sturgeon in the, in, the, in the Delaware River. And it was very uh, frank about how uh, the fisheries service in the past has at times been under a lot of political pressure to come up with uh, an answer that was not as favorable to the fish as it should have been. And uh, I don't know the context here for for Maine. You know, I, I, I believe your governor is is pro dam removal, um, although I'm not sure about that, uh, certainly more so than your previous governor. Uh, I don't know what the odds are. I, I, I would love to know. I know that they're supposed to make the uh, recommendation shortly. It's been postponed a number of times before. Uh, it is the right thing to do. I, I just you know, would hope that these um, biologists and staffers at NIMS would just have the uh, the courage to say, this is the right thing to do, because the Endangered Species Act gives them the power. The, um, um, some, someone here, Ted, Ted, Ted asks if you're familiar with the fish ladders at Woolwich, um, uh, that's from Lake Nequasset, Bristol, and uh, down Rascotta Mills, and are they doing their job? Those are all small alewife, um, ladders and and in my sense they seem to be doing a pretty good you know pretty good job i don't yeah, know i don't know thinking. woolwich and bristol but damaris got a um it, it's about as nice a fish ladder as you can imagine because it's you know kind of 
built into the landscape in a way that seems almost natural. And it exposes many, many people to the overall phenomenon of fish migrations because it has this great public event. So um, I, I think it's a terrific uh, facility. Char Charlie Spies, one of our members and, and a TU member um, asks, um, about the Brunswick Dam at head of tide here on the lower end road rated at 19 megawatts. If you assume that's its true production rate, my estimate is that roughly 100 acres of solar could replace that power. Does that sound close? Is there a figure that you use, John? For there is. I don't have it uh, memorized. I have a paper that was published uh, about Maine and replacing uh, your dams with solar power. It was the focus of the paper. So if anybody wants that, I'd be happy to send it to them. And we, uh, we looked at what it would take. In fact, some of the data I showed you tonight for the Kennebec are from that paper, but we also looked at the Mousin River, which is a you know tiny river compared to the Kennebec, but which I fell in love with when I was exposed to it. I think it's a gorgeous little river that has tremendous potential. Um, it still has a relic shad run. It has a relic alewife run. It has sea run brown trout and it has these dams that produce minuscule amounts of power. And there's just no excuse for having a dam without fish ladders that produces, you know, less than one megawatt of power. It's just, it's, it's just, you know, enough for a few toasters. What's the point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has, um, uh, Roger asks, has anyone looked at how flow regulation hinders or might hinder fish migration? You know, like low spring flows with higher winter flows. So, you know, we're, a lot of what we get is, is uh, you know, it's all artificially manipulated when there are dams in the picture. And, you know, you, you often you spring fresh it is, is uh, is not happening or it's 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 cut back you know in a large extent to to regulate things and save water for the summer so uh, yeah if there, if there's a paucity of water <coughs> you'll have a reduced run uh, my sense is that a lot of these fish come into rivers and then just sort of test the environment and you know move up towards this morning grounds when the temperatures are right and the flows are right and then there may be a period where it gets too cold for a few days or the water level gets too high or too low and they just have to sit there and wait for the right conditions. So as long as there's um, a point where they can hang on to there being the correct conditions, um, the population can persist. But if we start to get um, conditions that are too extreme, then that may uh, test them. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about climate just making the uh, river flows just too too variable. Yeah. Well, and as 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 you know, temperature is a key is a key you know, key factor for, for triggering uh, spawning. It's huge. Yeah. And, and, and so as, as, our, as our temperature changes, we get this, you know, more hot weather, both at spawn, at both at run time and in the summer. Uh, again, really the only way we have to regulate that is through increasing flows short of, you know, dam removal. And, and, and I've sort of advocated for a long time that, you know, the DEP used to have a SWAT program, surface water ambient toxics, looking at, you know, dioxin and PCBs and whatnot. And I'd sort of advocate for another SWAT to be sur surface water ambient temperature, you know, because we, we get these fish kill situations now and again now when it just gets too hot and, and the fish don't yeah. have to flow. And, uh, you know, and then they're all stuck and they're all breathing the same oxygen in a limited area. And, you know, it just sort of compounds on itself and you can get some pretty good kills. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's a... Interesting problem with um, fish ladders and, and shad, for instance, the Columbia River, shad are not native to the West Coast, but they were introduced and they have thrived in a lot of West Coast rivers, including the Columbia. And the Columbia has a run of about 3 million shad a year. And these fish actually use the ladders at the Bonneville Dam, but the ladders have a flow of 2,500 to 3,000 cubic feet per second. That is larger in the latter than the size of many East Coast rivers themselves. So mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of water to work with in comparison with places like that. And if you divert more water into a fish ladder, you get even less water going into the turbine. So you're left with this, this, this kind of conundrum, this choice between um, keeping the fish going but not making a, a living off the turbines or vice versa. And uh, you know, I think that has not been considered enough like in the Mousum, it's just, there'd be no point in putting a fish ladder there because if you put the water into the ladder, you would be <clears throat> reducing zero, zero the small, the small yeah. amount of power down to even the lower amount. And yep. what's the point? Yeah. Well, as, as you, you may know that in Brunswick, we have a, you know, we've been actually monitoring or, or 
filming shad for a number of years with an underwater uh, uh, sonar camera situation to just show how ineffective that ladder is. And, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, five to 8,000 shad below the dam. And, you know, they might pass 100, you know, or 100 or 200. And I'm sorry, where was this? Uh, in Brunswick. Okay. On, on the Androscoggin. So we're hoping to use those, you know, those data as we get into relicensing a little bit later in this decade here. Yeah. Ladders are funny too, in a way, in that, um, you know, we mentioned Dam Riscata working well for the uh, alewives. Even though shad and, and river herring are closely related, shad is a big water fish that is not happy being in a narrow ladder, whereas river herring are pre-adapted to swim up brooks and go from plunge pool to plunge pool. So mm -hmm. a fish ladder is not very different from um, a small alewife brook, whereas a fish ladder is very different from a big river for an American shad. There's a, uh, a ladder on the Farmington River that is so steep and long that uh, only two or three shad a year actually make it over it. And my colleague calls it the world's biggest fish descaler because they just get battered in this, in this thing. It's just not suited for that kind of a you know, an engineered structure. Yeah, as you were describing the, the, the ladder on the Columbia with, with all the shad going through it and the volume of the water, it's hard to envision, the, the, you know, the size of that, but there's got to be a lot more sort of surface area of structure, cement, you know, in all of our ladders here than, than in something like that. And the fish do really get dinged up um, pretty hard. Yeah. So, in what we've got. So there's probably more room to move out there on the Columbia in a ladder of that size. Well, yeah, the ladder is, is just tremendous. And the fish actually swim past a viewing window and the public sees Chinook salmon and pink salmon and, and, and shad all kind of flowing past in a, you know, in, in, in a steady stream, as opposed to what you see in the Merrimack, where if you saw a fish in a, in a given spring, you had a good year. So, well, <clears throat> the, um, um, I'll mention to folks that weren't here last month, and I don't know, John, if you've read any of Will Stoltzenberg's books, but uh, our last program was Wild, Where the Wild Things Were, and uh, I'm currently reading his Rat Island, which is about the effects of invasive, um, both people and you know things like rats uh, mm. on natives, but they're both really fabulous books and really talk about the abundance that you, you, know, you spoke about earlier and what we had and what we now have in pretty much all cases. And it's it's just, you know, it's tragic. So it's, um, yeah. yeah, I haven't read his work, but, you know, I think that something that is forgotten in the conservation world is our loss of abundance. And I say that in comparison with the concern about biodiversity and the loss of species. You know, mm -hmm. extinction, is, extinction is forever. And that's a pretty profound and hard thing to swallow. But there are so many species around the world that now exist in relic numbers and no longer are ecologically relevant or functional. And to me, that's um, an underappreciated aspect of the kind of world we're in right now. Yeah. So we, it's, it's a little after eight here. Um, well, I don't see any new, uh, anything new here. Thank you from Steve. Uh, uh, Steve Brook and and I think thank you again uh, you know from from us John I really appreciate you being here it's been a wonderful talk I look forward to having it up for people that um, missed it can you know can be able to watch it on on the website um, in a couple of days or so and uh, I should say I had a chance to uh, fly over the Kennebec once uh, in a small plane from the mouth all the way up to the headwaters and uh, I hope someday to actually do the same thing over a free flowing river I saw so many a dam. Well, hopefully, and uh, if, if you come up and fly with me in the spring, you'll see about uh, 300 eagles up on the Sebastocook. Uh, it's up to 300? Really? Wow. Uh, it was like sort of, I, I, uh, say, let's say a typical 100 between uh, um, the mouth of the Kennebec and, and Benton, 100 up to Burnham, and 100 now on China Lake, on the China Lake outlet stream. Wow. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's like, I, I, I think of the, the Western movies and the uh, chuck wagon and the cookie ring in the triangle for chow time, you know, so uh, they, they get the word out pretty quickly and uh, yeah. it, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It just shows you the power of these ecological connections. Yeah. And it's all, as, as a lot of people aren't aware, it's all coming at a critical time. And because these are um, migratory species, they are relatively clean fish. 
as opposed mm -hmm. to resident fish. Right. Right. Yeah, and we have a we have a slide. I'll I'll, I'll send you, John. After years ago, looked at some of the eel mortality before the Benton Falls Dam got got fixed up, and we sent that off. And you know the levels of PCBs in these turbine chopped up eels were you know like 600 times the level of where fish advisories go out or something. You know. Wow. Um, and and it suddenly it was like a light bulb went off. It was like you know, these eels that are obviously long lived and, and have a, a high contaminant load are really good at cleaning up rivers if we would let them, you know, let them leave. And instead yeah. they, get, they get chopped up and all of that contaminant stuff gets, the, the burden gets recycled back into these relatively small, you know, impounded sections of river available to snapping turtles and mink and raccoon and eagles and osprey and it's just sort of recycling, you know, these historically heavy uh, uh, burdens. You know? So anyway, um, yeah. but hopefully that's changing. So uh, we're running out of time. Thank right. you so much. Yeah. It was a pleasure. And, uh, you know, keep up the, the fight. There is a petition to uh, remove right. these dams available. And if you have a moment, you should try to sign it for whatever good that might do. Yeah. So again, we'll, we'll see if maybe we can get that on our website. I don't know, but the easiest way is probably, you know, Google uh Kennebec Valley Trout Unlimited yeah. uh, um Kennebec Dam petition and I'm sure you'll you'll find it there. Right. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks everybody for coming and we'll close it out and uh call it call it good and hopefully we'll see everyone uh uh next month, second Wednesday of the month for Al Al Manville and Birds and Bats. All right everyone take care. Bye.